Hello, No Extra Words listeners. This is Season 3, Chris's Audiobook Journal, for March 11th, 2019. My husband's family has a summer house. Um, That makes me sound very bourgeois, doesn't it? My husband's family has a summer house. Um, (laughs) I feel very lucky to have married into that. Um, It's just a small, quaint little place on a lake in northern Michigan, and we spend part of summers up there. And I like a lot of things about it, but I really like their little free library that is across the street because I do love me a good little free library. I read an article a while back about some criticism of little free libraries, how they're maybe not placed in the right locations to get literacy out to the broadest community possible. And there's some class issues there. I kept thinking, you know, there's class issues everywhere because we live in a classist society and that's a shame. But if you can look at a box of books that's designed for anyone to take reading material and somehow find that to be a bad thing, I kind of feel sorry for you. So I do love me a good little free library. Um, and this one's great. It has kids books too, which is fabulous. So two summers ago, we were out for a nightly walk and picking up our books from the little free library. And I grabbed one and that just looked interesting. I'm on vacation. Just looked like some light women's fiction. I do love browsing for books. Um, we'll talk sometime about why I'm a book browser and not a book orderer, at least when it comes to everything but the library. Um, but I found this book and I took it back to the cottage and I was sitting on the porch in the evening just reading it and... I was getting to know the character, and we were pretty early in the story, and then there be this giant exposition dump that unfortunately I think happens in Christian fiction. I didn't know picking this book up that it was Christian fiction. I didn't look that closely. But I feel like a lot of modern Christian fiction has this, and this is the part where we talk about God, um, which isn't the way literature works and isn't the way faith works and is super off-putting and is why I'm not a huge fan of the genre. And I felt very bait and switched (laughs) and I put the book down. Before I go on with this conversation, I want to start with the big disclaimers. Um, Yes, I am going to talk about books and faith. No, I am not interested in converting you at all. Um, That's not the purpose of this show or what I do here. So, Whatever your faith is or is not, you are welcome here. And no, I'm not exclusively going to talk about Christianity when I use the term faith. There's plenty of writing in other religious traditions. I don't know enough to be an expert in any of it, so I don't know if I'm going to be as diverse as I might love to be if I were a broader reader in this area. But as I've mentioned, this is not my genre. I don't usually read a lot of books that are about faith, but all are welcome here. I promise I'm not going to preach at you. Um, I will be open about my own faith tradition and religious affiliation just because it's part of my journey, but I have zero interest in converting you. Um, We are actually a mixed faith family. My husband is, I think the best way to describe it would be agnostic. I always say he's on his own journey because aren't we all? But um, I remember on our fourth date, the church came up in conversation and he kind of got nervous and he said, you know, I'm not really a church guy. And did you know that? And we made a deal then that I was not going to try to convert him and he was not going to stand in my way of my religious beliefs. And that was 11 and a half years ago and we're still doing okay. So, um, we are in many ways a mixed faith family, probably not as much as other families, but we have that to us, and um, we're surrounded by friends who come from a variety of faith traditions. So all are welcome here, and I really have no interest in preaching at you. I'm just going to talk about faith in books, which is what this particular show is about. So I don't read a lot of books written from a kind of faith perspective on occasion, but I have found myself picking up more and more this year. Um, And that really started from a place of writing more than it started from a place of reading. So I am going to start there. Um, In 2017, in November of that year, I participated in NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writing Month. And I had done it before, but I had kind of done it badly. And I have talked on previous episodes about that journey. And you can go back and listen to, to episodes from October and November of that year. And I do a little bit about about my NaNoWriMo experience. Um, but 
I didn't write the story I set out to write for that particular NaNoWriMo. I ended up writing um, the rough draft of a novel that I'm still working on that is about GLTBQ Christian teenagers, um, which was a book that I wanted to write and was afraid to write because I was afraid I didn't have the the identity to write it but nobody else was writing it and it was a story that was haunting me and so at the very last minute I chucked the outline for what I was going to write and wrote that story and like I said I'm still working on it it's currently deep in draft two um it is something that I really hope to get to a publishable state at some point but I found myself writing Christian fiction sort of a genre that I don't really read now I say Christian fiction sort of because it doesn't because of the subject matter, my manuscript doesn't fall into the traditional Christian fiction space. And I'm not sure that a lot of traditional Christian fiction writers would, or publishers would take it. Um, I think of it as very Christian, but there are different definitions and it makes me as a writer feel hard to place. Sometimes I wanted to go and, um, yeah, there was a weather incident, so I didn't make it, but I wanted to go to a local meetup of Christian writers. Um, I'm not a member of that organization, but they allow guests to come to their meetups, and I thought it'd be interesting to, to sit in a room and talk to other writers of faith, even if we don't agree on everything, just to have that conversation. And was bopping around on their website and realized that I don't qualify for membership to the organization because part of their faith statement has to do with... Um, marriage being between one man and one woman, which ironically is part of the plot of my book that, um, this organization loses their funding because the national umbrella organization, um, expands their face statement to say something very similar, which is based on a true story. Something that I heard on the news that a very big campus Christian organization that has many, many smaller organizations under it changed their language about a year and a half ago and cut a lot of people out. So as a writer of Christian fiction, um, puts me kind of on the outs. I will not claim to be the first person who ever, um, tried to write about, uh, Christian, gay Christians or, um, openly affirming, um, Christianity. There's an organization that, um, actually gives awards for the best depiction of, um, of gay Christians. And when I say gay Christians, I'm talking about true open, affirming organizations that allow people to be exactly who they are. Um, there are Christian organizations that allow um, GLTBQ people to participate if they are celibate and, you know, follow some strict guidelines. And that's not the kind of book I'm writing. So all of that said, I feel like I'm suddenly writing Christian fiction, which I don't read, and I'm writing a brand of Christian fiction that doesn't fit in the tent, so to speak. So that has me both reaching out for books on faith and also frightened. Um, and so that's where I'm at. It's an odd place to be. Hence, I wanted to come on the mic and talk about my relationship with these particular books. I'm going to take a break from that conversation and get to your book recommendation you didn't ask for. And today's is actually one of my favorite YA books on faith, and it's not Christian at all. Um, it is, I'm going to have to pronounce this author's name right, Rhonda Abdel Fata, I hope I'm saying her name right, wrote a book in 2005 called Does My Head Look Big in This? And it is one of my favorite books on faith for teenagers. Um, and it's the story of a young Muslim girl, I think she's about 15, who makes a decision to wear hijab. She's never worn hijab, nobody in her family wears hijab, but she comes to the decision that as part of her faith, she wants to do it. And her family, her classmates, her friends, her everybody has different reactions to that. Um, it's a great book, and it's been a while since I've read it, so I don't know how well it would hold up, but it has been made into a play and, you know, has shown itself to have some staying power. And what I love about it is I think there's a lot of assumptions about why people wear hijab and it's made very clear that this decision for this woman, as it is for a lot of women is, has nothing to do with pressure. She's not getting pressure from her mosque, from her family, from her, anybody else. It's just her decision to, to wear this as an expression of her faith. So 
it's an interesting book. Hope you'll check it out if that's something that interests you. Um, so when I say books about faith, yeah, they run the gamut for sure. And it would be a mistake to assume that Christianity is the only lens. And I feel like Christianity, at least in, in us publishing is the genre where the books tend to get really preachy. You know, it's not just a story of somebody living their faith. It's a story of why I should also have to live their faith, whatever narrow definition of their faith that may have. And that's why I was so off put by that book I picked up from the little free library. So, but I find myself reaching for this because I'm trying to write this. So I have to, to read in it. So one of the books I picked up recently was Alex Sanchez's The God Box. Um, Alex Sanchez is well known as a writer of GLTBQ books for YA. Um, and his is the, the God Box is pretty dated at this point. Fortunately, the world has moved on since that book was written in 2007. So some of the things that are in that book, um, there's a heavy emphasis on the conversion therapy. Conversion therapy has really gone out of vogue. I'm not saying it's gone away. Um, it needs to go away, but fortunately it is much less of a thing than it was 10 years ago. The two big organizations that used to do it have shut down. It's illegal in a number of States now. Um, and that would be the idea of, of trying to convert gay, especially children and teenagers into being straight through God. You got to pray the gay away, as they say. Um, it's gone underground because it's, um, so awful but unfortunately still does exist but that novel delves into that pretty deeply and that you know has kind of faded away and there's talk of a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage like some of those things are pretty dated now thank goodness in the book but the feelings the emotions the struggles of this conservative gay teenager um still feel very real it's a very interesting book and it was really nice to start to build a list, at least a little bit of a list of other people who had written um, GLTBQ Christian books as I try to to put mine out there. Um, I was having a conversation with the librarian of the church library. We have a fabulous church library, just absolutely wonderful, beautifully curated. It's a nice space. It's right near the entrance. Everybody has to walk past it. Church libraries run the gamut from like a shelf in a back corner on up, but ours is really, really, really nice space and, and just a beautiful collection. And the woman who has kind of been running it by default was saying that fiction is her hardest thing. You know, she can get kids books and she can get um, nonfiction books and all of that, but fiction is really hard because we are of a different philosophy in our Christianity than some of our brothers and sisters who are on the more conservative end. Um, I couldn't find the quote. I looked for it today, but the best description of this, I think, comes from Anne Lamott. Anne Lamott is one of the great voices in the progressive Christian movement. She's done several books of essays. I think the first one was Traveling Mercies, um, and there are several about her, her life and faith, and I think one of her more recent books was Hope Thanks Wow, the three prayers that you'll need. Um, but I remember in one of her early books, she was talking about having an encounter with a person who was maybe of a different faith event than her. And she said, well, he's of a brand of Christianity that believes that God is coming with fire and brimstone sometime next Thursday, and we all need to prepare and be ready. And I am of the sort that thinks that God has left this planet for us to take care of and will return when he's good and ready. <laughs> My particular church, my particular faith prog faith tradition is quite progressive. We ordain GLTBQ clergy, um, these kinds of things. And unfortunately, the issue of our GLTBQ brothers and sisters has been the defining issue that separates progressive Christianity from a more conservative type. And it's a whole, there's a whole bunch of other issues in the world that are, uh, that are different than that, that, um, that we all have different opinions on. But unfortunately what has happened is this issue has been so divisive that it has split the Christian church in the United States into two giant camps. You are either for or against. And most of the mainline Protestant denominations fall on the more progressive side. And most of your bigger, more Pentecostal charismatic churches fall on the other side. And that's where a lot of the Christian fiction writing comes from is that, that 
kind of other side. And so it's hard for this woman to buy Christian fiction for our library and our church. And also the nice thing about being Lutheran, which is what I am, is we are big believers in study and conversation and that not everyone has to feel the same way about every issue, but we do better when we keep discussing them and keep studying them. My minister is fond of saying that his friends in the clergy from other denominations say that being a Lutheran is kind of like getting a master's degree. We just never stop talking and never stop studying. Um, and so when we come out with statements, they are all very based in let's have ongoing conversations and let's, you know, continue to study and dive into these issues. So it's not like we all feel the same way in my church or any church about any issue. And it would be a pretty boring place if we did. So, um, so fiction is a hard one to buy and fiction is a hard one to read. And so when I found myself reaching for um, more writings around faith and Christian faith to do my reading, I found myself reaching more for nonfiction. And Lamont was certainly a big one. Another voice that is really big in the kind of progressive Christian movement is Nadia Bolz Weber. Um, I recently read her book, Pastrix, and then she has a new one that I'm waiting for at the library, Pastrix. Um, was actually a negative word thrown at female clergy members by more conservative Protestant denominations who don't believe that women should preach. Um, so her book, Pastrix, with her way of reclaiming that. Nadia Bowles Weber is sort of your anti-minister minister. She's got, you know, the full arm tattoos and the, she's kind of loud mouth and foul mouth. Um, I am trying to keep this podcast clean, but her first line in Pastrix is something along the line of, oh no, I'm late for theology class, but not that clean. <laughs> it's a wonderful book. It was a great read, a compelling read. And so I started reaching for some of that nonfiction, um, to fill in the gap. Another one. And I did pick up early this year, a couple that made me nervous because they felt like they came from that kind of other side of Christianity, but I didn't want to shut those doors. It just, it frustrates me that we have to sit in these boxes and be so narrowly defined in something as, as big and, and all consuming and, and sort of life altering as faith. So the two that I picked up were Jordan Rayner's call to create, which is a book for, um, Christian, mainly entrepreneurs, but also creative types about why, um, we are called to make a difference in the world. I think sometimes Christians are taught that they need to be living for the beyond and doing everything, you know, um, and not to be confronted by the things of this world, but there is a call to be creative and build businesses and build artworks. And, um, my review on Goodreads of that book was basically, I feel like if that author and I were to sit down and have a cup of coffee, we would not agree in everything about the tenets of each other's faith, but we would probably come away with a healthy respect for each other. And I felt like I could get that out of his book. Um, and I actually ended up buying it for a friend, which is a great compliment that I can pay for a book that I got from the library. And the other one I picked up was Jen Hatmaker's um, for the love, which is about grace. Grace is big with us Lutherans. Um, and it felt very mom bloggy, but was fun. It was a good read. Um, and it just, you know, it's nice to not feel like we have to spend our, our lives being divided. The most recent nonfiction that I picked up, I actually talked about in last week's episode, which was Madeline Langle's Walking on Water. And I finished that since I told you about it. And the way I describe it is, um, it felt very unfinished. It felt very stream of consciousness. It felt very like I'm thinking this as I'm writing it, which would annoy me if it came from basically anybody else. But it's Madeline Langle, so who cares? <laughs> I will listen to Madeline Langle ramble about faith, philosophy, and writing all day, every day, forever. <laughs> so that was a fun read. And so, like, it's been really fun to kind of immerse myself in these books about faith and, and you know, to not be afraid to kind of touch these, which I was for a long time. And I think having to write this story, feeling compelled to write about faith, um, opened a door for me. But there was still that big barrier to fiction <laughs> because fiction is the hard part because I feel like what happens so often in Christian fiction is there's this separation between the story and the faith and I think people who live in faith and who live in religion don't work that way 
you know, there's not the you that is living your life and raising your kids and going to work and doing the things you do. And then the you that is fill in the blank, Episcopalian, Jewish, pagan, whatever you are, whatever your belief system is questioning, whatever that is, those things are not separate in anybody's life. And yet we get to this point in these books where it's like, we'll talk about the story and we'll do story, 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 story. And then God, I don't think it always was that way. You know, one of the icons of Christian writers is C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis is famous for this allegory of the Christian faith that he wrote in the Chronicles of Narnia. Okay, I'm going to stop for a minute because I have to do librarian compression time. Come close, you guys. I'm going to share it. I'm laying it on the table today. I don't like the Chronicles of Narnia. I never have. I didn't like them as a child. I don't like them now. Let me be clear. I do not think they are bad. I do not think they are bad for you. I do not think they should be banned. I do not think any of you are bad people for reading them, loving them, sharing them with your children, whether religious or not, by the way. Me personally, they're not my particular cup of tea. That said, he's one of the most famous Christian writers, you know, ever, and has this amazing allegory, but it's like, it is story first. Those books would not still be around. They would not still be read. They will not still be an icon of kids' literature if they weren't 100% based in story with the allegory secondary. And unfortunately, that feels to me, at least, as somebody who doesn't read this genre, (laughs) I'll be honest, it feels like the exception rather than the rule. So all of that, that's all my baggage, that's all my barriers. And all of that takes me back to the church library because I was walking out of it a couple weeks ago and the lovely woman I was talking about earlier, Linda, had put on display for February fiction, particularly women's fiction, but fiction. Um, she does, she does theme displays every month and February was fiction. And I had just picked up from the library before we were yours and I had just started reading that. That's not Christian fiction. Um, it's historical fiction. Pretty, it was pretty good. Um, but I come across one of these books that's Christian fiction from the church library. And it was blurbed on the front. So you know the blurb are those, those quotes from other authors about why you should read this book. It was blurbed by Lisa Wingate, who wrote Before We Were Yours. And I thought, okay, I'm going to be brave. I don't know how Christian this is. But I'm going to be brave, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to try it. And I read a chapter, and I read another chapter, and then I dove into this book, and it was beautiful. It's, um, no one ever asked. It's by Katie Gansert, and I actually, guys, for real, ended up liking it more than Before We Were Yours, which is why I picked it up in the first place. I didn't dislike Before We Were Yours, but no one ever asked was my favorite read of February. And it's from three different women's point of view. It's also based on a true story of a school district in Missouri that lost its accreditation. And so the students were allowed to attend the very ritzy suburban school district next door. So you have this racial and class clash going on, not in 1950s, but in contemporary Missouri. And you're getting the story of three women. So you have the mom who's been on the PTA and who's been part of this ritzy school district for a long time and her kids go there and she's really nervous about what the influx of this new student population is going to do to the schools and the kids and everything else and then you have the african-american teacher whose dad worked in the school district that just lost its accreditation and she's just been hired by the other school district so she is walking the line and she's having to do a lot of code switching and you know testing her wings in this new space and then you have the white mom who just adopted a black daughter and is sending her to this school district in the middle of all this chaos and that that character comes closest to katie cancer because as i was reading this book i found myself wondering okay so who are you the writer because the other thing and this is true of me the writer as well given what i'm writing um writing about a character who's not like you is a challenge anyway, and it's something that white writers have done too much of, so we have to watch our privilege. Um, The flip side is that we also need diverse characters 
in our stories. So, um, I admire Katie Ganser for taking on this challenge of these three very different characters. Um, Katie Ganser herself is a mom who adopted a black daughter. So that's the sort of her own personal worldview that she comes to in writing this book. It was great. I mean, it was really, there was a lot to it. It was brutal. Um, the characters felt very real, very real. And I, I really, really liked this book. It had a generous sampling of faith in it. Probably not enough for people who read Christian fiction regularly, but for me, it was great. You know, you had these women coming back to their faith in tough times and talking about it and referencing it and referencing relationships, um, in a way that felt very real to me. It felt like the way actual people talk about their actual faith and their actual church rather than the way people do it in books. So for whatever that's worth, I enjoyed the book thoroughly and it made me want to pick up The Hate You Give by Andy Thomas, which I started reading last summer and just couldn't handle the emotion of because I was newly postpartum at that time and it was just really rough. Um, The Hate You Give tackle some of these same issues around what it's like to be, uh, you know, a student, a black student, a predominantly white school and the code switching that has to go on and the racial tensions and the, um, it focuses around the, um, the shooting of a friend of, uh, a black student in a white high school. Um, it, I, I'm going to pick it up again. This book, no one ever asked really inspired me to go back into that issue and, and feel the feels. And if a book can make you want to do that, if it can make you want to take on the tough stuff, it's done its job. And as a writer, I, that's all I could ever hope for is that I could someday write a book that could do that. So I think my journey with the books of Christian writers over the last several months has been to be less scared and to be less divisive, and to try to put our books and our faith and our everything else into fewer boxes. And it's hard. Um, Publishing is a big business, and publishers, including Christian publishers, have to cater to their primary audiences, and things that push the envelope can be a a tough financial risk sometimes. Um, And I think probably no one ever asked, made some people who read Christian fiction pretty uncomfortable but in all the right ways and for all the right reasons and it made me want to keep writing what I'm writing because I think it's important checking your faith at the door doesn't help anybody um, nor does putting it in a box when we talk about wanting complete characters who live full lives this has to be part of it but it has to be real that's the number one thing is it has to be real so I have a good read shelf that's labeled faith and I'm going to continue to make these books part of my, my world. So there's one more thing I do want to talk about. Um, but I'm going to save it for our next episode. Um, because another big part of no one ever asked is this idea that we all think we're the good guy and how we write bad guys and how we write characters with problematic issues and how we read them. And that's huge because I think Katie Ganser does a great job of making her character, who is a pretty racist person, believable and sympathetic. And that is hard because it puts you in an uncomfortable place and you realize that you could be her. And not all people who say racist things in meetings are necessarily bad guys. That's a hard one. That's a really, really hard one. We're going to talk about that next week in a conversation about biography and history and where we put the actions of people in terms of how they fit in the world. And I don't have answers for that one either, but I want to live the hard stuff, which is why I pick books that make me do so. But I'm going to sign off for today. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys. As always, you can find me at noextrawords.wordpress.com, um, noextrawords at gmail.com. And I'm at no extra words in all the places. I really like to make book friends on Instagram if you're hanging out over there and then also Goodreads. So my name is Chris. This is no extra words and I will talk to you again. Oh, so soon.